Hi, it's Dr. David Green, founder and CEO of R3 Stem Cell International. Today's topic is umbilical cord tissue. Is it safe to use clinically? Well, it's an increasingly important topic, one that I've been meaning to do a presentation on for the last few years. The use of umbilical cord tissue and umbilical cord blood has been on the rise big time for a while now, especially because of its ethical acquisition. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. It's being used increasingly for malignancies of the blood when there's no bone marrow match available. It's also being used for many non-malignant conditions such as autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, autism, spectrum disorder, arthritis, wound care, spinal cord injury, diabetes, central nervous system diseases, liver failure, graft versus host disease, and more. There's even lots of studies now on COVID um, that are in the early stages. And there are many beneficial effects for the recipient um, of the umbilical cord tissue. There's an immunomodulatory effect of the tissue, immunosuppression, paracrine effects, which are cell-to-cell -cell signaling, and uh, umbilical cord stem cells have excellent self-renewal. So the ultimate question though is, yeah, it has great effects, but is it safe to use umbilical cord tissue from an unrelated donor? So we're going to get into that. This, here's what we're going to talk about. The anatomy of the umbilical cord, how it's acquired for use clinically, why it has significant benefits versus other types of tissue, the applications for it, and I'll show you plenty of data on safety. So anybody who's seen an umbilical cord knows that it can be pretty long um, and it's pretty irregular type of appearance just like you see here. And it really does supply, it's the lifeline for the growing baby inside the uh, mother. It supplies all of the blood and nutrients and oxygen necessary. Uh, but once a baby's born, you know, it often becomes medical waste. So the way that it's obtained ethically around the world is after a vaginal or C-section birth, um, a woman will donate the tissue for research or clinical use, and um, there's an extensive uh, screening process uh, for it to be ready to get used. Here's what uh, cross-section looks like of the umbilical cord. There are two arteries in the umbilical cord and one vein, all right? you can see that surrounding the artery in the vein, there's a gelatinous material called Wharton's jelly. And that's very rich in active stem cells, uh, cytokines, exosomes, all types of regenerative elements. Um, and then as you get out to the outer part, there's a layer called the amnion and then the subamnion. So how do these, how does the umbilical cord tissue get sourced? Well, in most births, the umbilical cord is discarded as medical waste. Um, there's no e ethical issues with donating. Uh, the process includes no harm to the baby or the mother. Um, if you look at the FDA regulations, they have a comprehensive maternal screening um, where the mother has to give blood and it gets screened and there's a medical history um, as well. So for instance, if the woman's had a tattoo, she's uh, excluded. If there's a history of drug use and smoking, excluded. You know, so it goes on and on. And then with the tissue itself, as it gets processed at one of the FDA regulated labs, there's a complete disease testing profile performed. Um, in Mexico, um, the lab we work with uh, actually does testing that's more stringent than the FDA for all types of, of communicable diseases. Um, and during the processing, none of our labs use any foreign reagents like fetal bovine serum or something like that. So what types of cells are in the umbilical cord? Why is it such a, um, a, a sexy tissue to use for regenerative procedures? Well, when you look at the hematopoietic stem cells, these, they've been shown to be superior to those in adult bone marrow in basically every way. They are more proliferative, they have more differentiation potential, they're more numerous. Um, just everything you can think of with regards to hematopoietic stem cells, they're just better. They also have angiogenesis stimulating cells. They help produce new blood supply. And the mesenchymal stem cells have the ability to transform into neuron cells, liver, osteoblastic, and bone 
cardiac and more. And those MFCs also secrete cytokines, exosomes, and growth factors. So you have a lot of regenerative elements that come from those MSCs. The MSCs coming from the umbilical cord are capable of a lot of proliferation, and that expansion could go up to 20 times. Bone marrow has only been shown to be good up to five times, and adipose up to about eight. So MSCs from the umbilical cord have much higher proliferation potential. There's something also called unrestricted somatic stem cells that are seen in umbilical cord tissue, and that resembles embryonic stem cells in that they are pluripotent in their differentiation capacity, but they don't have the bad characteristics of embryonic stem cells. They're not going to turn into a tumor. They're not going to get rejected by the body. So that's a fantastic uh, set of cells in the tissue. So why is umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells just better than bone marrow? Well, if you look at this study, uh, umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells, the new gold standard, they showed that umbilical cord derived MSCs are more primitive, meaning that they have more potential for differentiating into different types of cells. They're able to replicate more, which I just mentioned, and they have better immunosuppressive capabilities than those from an adult bone marrow. So with more proliferation capacity, more differentiation pot potential, these cells can be induced to form a diverse array of cell types, um, much, much better potential than those found in bone marrow. So will umbilical cord blood and the tissue cause a rejection? This was one of my concerns when, when I started R3 stem cell eight years ago. Um, and as more and more studies came out showing that it doesn't. Um, you know, we, our center started using the tissue. This is uh, information from a 2007 paper um, from Dr. Riordan's group, Cord Blood and Regenerative Medicine, Do We Need Immune Suppression? So in this paper, they went through some history, such as in the 1930s, they were actually using cord blood for transfusions. Um, they didn't even know what HLA matching was back in that time frame, and they didn't have any adverse events. And then in 1999-2004, there was another study of 129 patients that received umbilical cord blood with no preconditioning or HLA matching, and they didn't have in, any immunologic reactions, no rejection. When I mention preconditioning, that's in a patient who, let's say, has cancer, and they want to knock out their immune system and then give them a bone marrow or umbilical cord transplant, okay? In that study, they didn't do any of that knocking out of the immune system. They just gave them the umbilical cord blood with no issues. Now, uh, they also looked at uh, graft versus host disease to see if cord blood treatments would cause that to happen. Um, that has not been seen. In fact, umbilical cord tissue, umbilical cord blood is now used as a treatment option for graft versus host disease. So. Not only did it not cause a problem, it actually created a huge benefit. Um, and many clinical trials um, up to then and, and since then have used an off-the-shelf universal donor mesenchymal stem cells from umbilical cord blood. And we'll get into that here more. So in this study, the impact of graft recipient ABO compatibility on outcomes after umbilical cord blood transplant for non-malignant diseases. That's a very long title, but basically what it means is they didn't look for a blood match um, in these studies. And what the author stated is that as the future for umbilical cord blood expansion technologies is bright, we assessed whether this typically overlooked graft characteristic impacted outcomes following umbilical cord blood transplantation. So they did, the, did a study where they didn't even consider ABO cross-matching. Um, in 270 patients, and the ABO compatibility status didn't impact outcomes at all, and they didn't have any rejection of the tissue. Here's another study that was done a couple years later. Donor to recipient ABO mismatch does not impact outcomes of the allogeneic hematose poetic cell transplantation, and when they talk about allogeneic genetic hematopoietic cell transplantation, they're not just talking about umbilical cord blood, they're talking about um, other types of tissue as well. But 
What they notice is that ABO incompatibility does not impact the outcomes. It did not cause a rejection. It wasn't necessary in these studies or treatments to do cross-matching of the blood. Um, and it, they deemed it not to be a critical factor, which is awesome. So here's a study from a few years ago. Um, umbilical cord mosaicomal stromal cell transplantations, a systemic analysis of clinical trials. So this is what's called a meta-analysis, where a group of authors pulls a ton of studies. In this case, they pulled 93 studies, uh, looking at 53 different disease conditions, and cumulatively, it was over 2,000 patients in these studies. What they saw is that were there, there were no long-term adverse effects, no tumors, no cell rejection were reported. And incidentally, all of these studies with the umbilical cord tissue showed certain degrees of therapeutic benef benefit with the clinical symptoms and laboratory findings. So here is another page, paper by Dr. Riordan's group, Allogeneic Human Umbilical Cord Mesenchymal Stem Cells for Treatment of Autism Spectrum Disorder. So these were kids 6 to 16 years of age who had diagnosis of, of autism spectrum disorder, 20 patients who had four infusions four times over a period of nine months, and they followed them for two years. So when you do the math, out of the patients who finished the study, it was 296 infusions total. Each patient received a total of 144 million stem cells. So think about that. A six-year-old weighs, what, 50 pounds-ish? 144 million stem cells is a lot of cells. What they noted is that there were no treatment-related serious adverse events. Uh, for the whole two years. Only mild to moderate adverse events for a short period of time. So if you look at the table on the right, you can see that the mild adverse events included fatigue or headache, a little bit of fever, and then, you know, two patients had increase in anxiety, inflammation. But when you look at the length of duration, it was less than three days for all of these. So, you know, really mild to moderate was it, nothing severe. Here's a study, uh, 2019 out of China, where they looked at efficacy and safety of umbilical cord stem cell therapy for rheumatoid patients. And this was 64 patients who each had IVs of 20 million stem cells. They did give them a steroid prior to the treatment. Um, and they noted that over the period of time they followed them, uh, up to three years, there were no adverse events. They did see that liver, kidney function, immunoglobulin levels in these rheumatoid arthritis patients um, were all within the normal range um, during the uh, duration of the treatment, and the patients did fantastic. In this study, they referenced a previous study, so I went and looked at it. And same group out of China, 2013, they looked at 172 patients. So they put them into two groups. One had a placebo, the other half had 40 million stem cells infused. Um, and in this study also, no serious adverse events. And the vast majority of patients achieved uh, rheumatoid arthritis remission uh, for the whole six months of the study. All right, here's another safety paper um, in patients with severe CP. And this was retrospective, 47 patients that averaged age of six years. So 20 to 30 million cells were done four times for each patient, so 100, 120 stem cells. They did half of them IV and the other half right into the spinal canal intrathecal. They didn't have any treatment-related serious adverse events, no death, no graft versus host, no infections, no pneumonia. Um, they just had some minor types of issues, and you see it here, fever, vomiting, and then it goes way down, seizure, headache. Um, and when you look at the time of occurrence, you know, this is like less than a day, uh, two days, uh, you know, these are very short-lived uh, phenomenon. All right, here's a paper, another paper on autism with 37 kids for, with human uh, cord blood. Um, and these kids had 20 million stem cells transfused. Um, transplantation demonstrated effectiveness compared to the control group. Um, however, they had a combination of cord blood and umbilical cord tissue showed the largest therapeutic effect. And there were no safety issues during infusion and during the whole monitoring period of time. I'd like to include these studies with the younger kids because if you show 
that huge transfusions of stem cells with umbilical cord blood into kids is safe, then you know that's really saying something um, about the safety. So there's a couple papers regarding uh, tumor potential, uh, tumor just tumorigenicity evaluation of umbil umbilical cord blood derived stem cells. Um, in this study they showed that human umbilical cord blood MSCs do not exhibit tumorigenic potential either in vitro in the lab or in vivo in the body under their experimental conditions. So in addition to the fact that they don't get rejected they don't cause tumors. Here's another paper about um, Wharton's jelly of the umbilical cord um, and this was an animal study. So no animal that received human Wharton's jelly stem cells developed tumors or inflammatory reactions at the injection site. And they followed them for months. So this also deemed, um, actually they gave, these were human stem cells that they gave to animals. So they noted that they were non-tumorigenic. So in conclusion, you know, I just showed a few studies, right? But there's so many out there. Many studies to date have shown that umbilical cord blood and tissue and Wharton's jelly is safe for clinical use. No preconditioning needed, no ABO matching made a difference. The tissue does not lead to rejection. It does not lead to any tumors. The, any adverse events in the studies you saw were mild to moderate and resolved within a couple days. Fever, some vomiting, things like that, very temporary. And the indications for umbilical cord tissue continues to expand rapidly. So at our treatment programs internationally, in Mexico, <clears throat> we do our treatments in either Tijuana, which is 20 minutes from the San Diego airport, or Mexicali. The process starts with a free phone consultation with one of our licensed, experienced stem cell doctors. They'll listen to your clinical history. They're going to want to see some medical records if you have them. Um, and make sure that you're a good candidate, and how many cells would be best, or maybe exosomes too, would be good to add into the treatment. We do have each patient gets a concierge representative dedicated to their case, so they'll help with travel logistics, including we provide travel from the airport to the clinic and back. Um, we've been winning a lot of awards lately, the 50 smartest companies of the year, 10 most innovative companies of the year, R3 has been featured in most of the major media outlets. I'll come back to this slide, you know, such as you see here, ABC, Forbes, Fox. I do want to spend one slide talking about the cells that we use. Um, GenCell is the lab in Mexico City that we work with. Uh, for seven years now, they've had a pristine safety record. Um, the biologic is umbilical cord tissue and blood. The quality assurance at the lab is actually more stringent than what you see at the FDA. Um, I did a video on that, the quality assurance, where you can see the tissue, you can see the certificate of analysis. The umbilical cord stem cells are allowed to be cultured in Mexico. There's no preservative needed either, so 95% plus viability. Our lab keeps the cells below the fifth generation during culturing, so they're very pure, very potent, and powerful. So to get the process started for treatment, um, go to our website at stemcelltreatmentclinic.com. Um, there you'll see information on a lot of the conditions that we treat. There's a lot of videos showing the experience, a lot of testimonials. And then give us a call to set up your free phone consultation at 888-988-0515.